Hello, and a very warm welcome to another session of The Change Exchange. My guest today, Matthew Booth, that uh, most of you will know from his football playing days, but uh, that's a bit in the past now, so we'll have to talk about what's happening. Welcome. Very oh, glad to have you. Thank you for having me. Tell me about the beginning, because for a white middle class kid to start playing football, which is in South Africa very much a black sport, at the age of five, how did that happen? I think um, a lot of people think that, uh, but, but I have a different view. Uh, my experience uh, tells me that, um, especially at junior level, football is um, very multiracial. But and becoming more so? Yes, well, I certainly hope so. But what I, what I have found is that it's very much a, a class issue where your middle, middle class to upper class kids, no matter what color they are, tend to fall by the wayside um, when they get to 16, 17 years old. And we're losing a lot of kids that way, of all uh, different hues. Um, and the ones that are that are left are the ones that are more hungrier and have less options available to them. So your middle class, upper class kid will get distracted a lot easier by other things. And it, that's a global thing. Um, a lot of interesting. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. a lot of scouts mm -hmm. who look for talent won't bother going to the suburbs. They'll go to uh, your your ghettos or your here in South Africa your location to find to, to find talent. Mm -hmm. But you yourself, tell me about your background. Your father was an administrator of the Fishhook Football Club, which must have been quite extraordinary in the 70s. Yeah, he was, um, he was chairman for a long time there. Um, he, he worked for the, for the city of Cape Town for over 40 years. Uh, he's been married to, to my mum for that, that time as well. Um, so, yeah. Definitely from a generation which is not, not the norm nowadays, but um, he gave a lot to to the local area, uh, Fishhook Valley, and um, you know during the the late eighties, um, the club uh, started accepting uh, kids from from all different backgrounds, and that got him into trouble a bit. Um, but football historically, even in the I remember in nineteen sixty nine they attempted. Um, Friendly between Highlands Park and Orlando Pirates and Bobani and Swaziland. Um, because it was against the law in South Africa. Yeah, that's yeah. right. So, football, I've always been quite proud of the fact. Um, in, I think in 1972, uh, they attempted the first multi multiracial league, professional league. Um, so, the football industry has always been quite progressive. And you were never tempted into the uh, the traditional cricket and rugby that your schoolmates would have been playing. Yeah, I was. Um, we were kind of forced to to play uh, rugby and cricket, but um, not myself in particular because I love both those sports. Uh, I played as a as a lock uh, in the beginning, and then I think they realised that I could actually kick the ball, and they changed me to fly off. Um, and I still I miss my cricket the most. Um, obviously, I, well, I played first team uh, cricket at school and a bit of club cricket, um, and it's something that I would love to start again on a social level, uh, I, and I love watching it. Also. So, what drew you towards football as a focus? Um, I was probably better at it oh. than than rugby and cricket. Yeah, that um, always makes a difference. Yeah, it does. <laughs> um, I uh, coming. I I went to a government school. I just kind of got the feeling as well that um, I needed to be at a, perhaps a private school to, to progress in, in, in cricket or rugby. Um, hopefully that has changed mm. uh, of late, but I think it's, it's the economics of the situation that draws the talent to the best schools, uh, which is quite normal. Um, but yeah, definitely football was my, my first love and um, quite early on. I think in my just before my matric year, I got uh, scouted. So that gave me the, the sort of impetus and the momentum and, and realization that I could make a career out of it. Can you remember that? Um, what's the word? Uh, understanding that this could be more than just a pastime. This can actually be my profession. 
Um, there probably wasn't a moment. It's, it's it developed over yeah. a number of years, and I'm not I'm not that emotional. I'm not that deep of a thinker, um, and I think probably the some of the best sportsmen are not that imaginative. You know? So one thing so, leads to another. <laughs> yeah. So we don't we don't think too much about uh, processes or choices really. Um, and for me, I must say I was fortunate that I did have this opportunity uh, because for the life of me after school, I didn't know what I was going to do. Uh, I had an interest in uh, anthropology, anthropology and history. Um, but, you know, other than that, I was pretty Didn't know how to make clueless. a living out of that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. How did uh, your parents respond when you said you were going to play professionally? It was, it was a dialogue um, between them. I, I've always confided in them. I still do now. In, in, in my choices. Uh, I believe that the more sort of sage advice you get from your elders, uh, the better your, your choice will be. So certainly I confided in him, both of them being uh, a sportsman. Uh, my mom still plays tennis. My dad only retired from playing social football a couple of years ago. Um, so they were first of all very happy for me. Uh, a little bit worried at first about my matric year. Because uh, I had to travel a lot uh, with my on the train with my with my books studying to get to the northern suburbs of, of Cape Town um, to, to train with Cape Town Spurs. So they were a little bit concerned in that regard, um, but they were all for it. How did you experience the the completely different social environment that it took you into? Because it, it must have been, I mean, this was what, uh, late 80s? No, early 90s. Yeah, uh, 90, and, 94, 95. Yeah. Uh, and uh, South African society was still mm -hmm. even more segregated than it is now. And you were really crossing a divide. I didn't really feel that, that speed bump. Um, I, so it was about the sport and that united you and that was... that. Took you through. It was about the sport, and yeah. I think from a, from a very young age, it assimilated me into uh, going going into Guguletu as a four-year-old to play football, going into Langa, going to uh, spending the weekend with my mate in Manenburg, uh, and, sure. and <laughs> experiencing what it was like, and that that just like travel, uh, experiencing new cultures and being open-minded and not fearful. Um, leads to your your mind broadening and you becoming more intelligent you know about South African society uh, a lot of people have you know they, they create this bubble um, for themselves with whether it's uh, by their own design or not and I feel that's always kind of an unhealthy situation mm -hmm. when it comes to viewing your opinion so people surround themselves with people who are like themselves. Mm. Absolutely. And, and you've been privileged, I think, to not ever live like that. Yeah. Uh, uh, privileged, I would definitely say so. Um, and uh, I'm eternally grateful for the sport for, for doing mm. that for me. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's a choice that you make. Um, I wish more people would, would take it. For example, you could take it on a broader, broader perspective in the United States or Russia. Two very big countries. Uh, not many people back in the day used to travel a lot, and certainly when I spent time in Russia, uh, I experienced that kind of ignorance because of the lack of travel. It is changing now, but certainly there is a generation which which has not experienced the rest of the world. The horizons are very close. Mm. Yeah, um, you were you started playing professionally, I think, when you were nineteen, and the next year it was the Olympics. Was that a big thing? Absolutely. That was one of my change moments. <laughs> um, I think um, it was a very long journey for us. Uh, it was one of the few projects that Safa, our mother body, actually signed off on and stuck to with the help of um, uh, corporate as well. Um, they, they kept us together, the core of the team together, and they actually had a a vision over a period of six years. They kept the same coach, the core of the team stayed the same, and we had a small glimmer of success. And they haven't yet replicated that again, which is uh, quite sad. Um, 
So from a sports development point of view, from a youth development point of view, that needs to be replicated again. Mm -hmm. Because we had a great team. A lot of good players came out of that team. Um, and the journey was was uh, an incredible one, even more so than the actual tournament itself. And for footballers um, to be to be able to have Olympian on your CV, it's quite quite something because at men it, for the men you probably only get one opportunity because it's an under twenty three tournament, so it's a one it's once in a lifetime opportunity, um, which was yeah to make it was unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. And the twenty ten World Cup, how did you experience that? Yeah, that was um, again to. I think the the tournament before the Confederations Cup in two thousand and nine was when we had a lot of foreign uh, journalists come and send on us, and I think that was probably one of my best uh, tournaments uh, in in my career, and I got a lot of I generated a lot of interest out of that. Um, a lot of the journalists didn't realize uh, that the fans were were not. Booing me. Yeah, they were say, saying your name. Saying my name, which is a tradition <laughs> amongst uh, football fans. So that took a lot of explaining and that created a bit of interest. And the fact mm -hmm. that I was the only white player in the team was a little bit embarrassing, a little bit uncomfortable for me because um, it just so happened at that time, I happened to be the only white player in the team. But if you look at the history of our, our Bafana Bafana team, it's always been quite uh, representative of our demographics. Um, and 2010, to, to be part of that squad, or to be part of a World Cup, is unbelievable. To be part of the, a World Cup that's been hosted by your, your, your nation is just quite something. Uh, yeah, we all experienced that kind of amazing high, yeah. and we were completely on the, out, on the fringes. It must have been amazing to be at the heart of it. Yeah, a lot of people are still suffering from withdrawal symptoms. Right? So, um, I, I, the image that I'll always take back with me is going on an open top bus uh, around Santon. I think there, there was estimated to be about 200, 250,000 people out on the streets uh, wishing us well. We took a bit of criticism for that because uh, people thought that we were celebrating, you know, before the tournament had even started. But I think it was important for the players themselves to realize how important it was to the nation. Uh, and that was that was a real eye opener. And then, for the six months prior to that, we had been isolated as a team. We had gone to we travelled to Brazil for a month. We had gone to Germany for a month. We had camped in South Africa, away from the public eye. Uh, so for five or six months, uh, we had missed our families, and we didn't actually realize what was going on back here in South Africa. So I felt at that moment, going on that bus was extremely important for the players to realize what it meant. The support that they had, yeah. yes. Um, and then just four years later, you decided to retire. You could have um, renewed your contract, but you decided not to. Why? Yeah, I um, shortly after, well, I think it was a year or two later, I suffered a really, really serious injury. Um, I then had a bit of a disappointment in my club at the time, Sundowns, uh, didn't renew my contract or offer to rehabilitate my, my injury. And that made me a little bit, you know, quite furious actually at the way that they had treated me at the time after having given them good service. And it drove me to get better and stronger. And I followed my rehab to the T, spent more money on it, and made sure that I got back fitter and stronger. I then spent two years in Cape Town at Ajax Cape Town and one year at Bits University, which was my last season. And it was almost a, a process of wanting to prove mm -hmm. something to to them um, that I still had what it what it took. Uh, I, I've always been a competitor and um, I've always hated losing. Um, even from when I was a small small kid, you know, I used to play chess or tiddly wings with my sisters, and I used to take my ball home with me, you know, that kind of thing, <laughs> if things didn't go my way. Um, and I think that's an important aspect of any professional uh, athlete, to have that fine balance between competitiveness and, and arrogance. Um, and uh, I, I then, 
after the one season at Bits, um, you know, after waking up in the morning continually with, with aches and pains, mm. uh, having put my family through the, the journeys and the whole process of, of bringing a, a partner to an athlete, I decided to, to call it quits um, while I still had a pretty well, a decent reputation <laughs> because you can, you can lose it very quickly um, and people have very short memories. So it was a mixture of those elements. Going at yeah. top, yeah. But it's how does one do that? Um, the transition from being a top athlete and in the nation's hearts, and then suddenly you're just an ordinary, the next guy on the street. Emotionally, it must be incredibly difficult. Uh, it is. It's done with great difficulty. A lot of my um, my ex colleagues uh, suffer because of it. Uh, we are not prepared for it. Mm. Physically, psychologically, you know, emotionally, um, financially, nobody prepares you for it. And it's, it's about time that we as uh, athletes start to realize that, learn from our, uh, our, our more experienced players and elders, and not make the same mistake. There, there's a certain status uh, to being a, a professional footballer, and a lot of people think that we earn the same as our English counterparts or European counterparts. Um, and we kind of try and keep up with the Joneses in that, re in that regard. And we just can't afford to. Um, so you spend it as, uh, um, you in general, spend it as you earn it instead of building up something for at the end of a career which is tied to your physical condition. Yeah. I mean, we all do something stupid with our first salary. Um, <laughs> But for a pro footballer, you need to, to realize a lot sooner uh, there's, a, there's a point which we all miss uh, with regard to saving and, and sticking to a standard of living that will bide you over into retirement. Um, but, but it's a double-edged sword because in South Africa, players earn good money. I mean, at the top clubs, players can be earning 250 to 300,000 rand a month. Sure. There's a wide range. Yeah. And it's the middle and the lower that you've got to be careful of because you can get a youngster coming into the pro ranks who earn $5,000. Um, and the clubs generally, they run by businessmen who are only interested in you as a commodity, you know, as, a, as an a asset, as a player. Once you, once you don't have any value for them anymore, they really don't care about you. Which is all good and well. There's no pension scheme. No, you have to do that yourself. Um, the players union is trying their best to, but they need a complete buy-in from the league, which I don't think they've got really. Um, uh, and uh, but but I still feel positive about our our industry. I think the players are starting to wise up. Um, players are starting to read more. They're becoming educated, and once the talk in the changing room changes from the latest car or girlfriend that you have to what I'm studying or what I... The shares what, I've bought. The shares I've bought or the, the meeting that I had with my financial advisor. advisor. Once, it becomes that, once that becomes in vogue, you know, <laughs> that, will, that mentality will definitely change. Yes. So uh, may I ask how you've handled it? Did you start saving soon enough? I, I did. Um, I think the best thing that I did was uh, 10 to 15 years, or oh, I think it was 15 now, I think it was 12 years ago, I sat down with my wife and our financial advisor. And a lot of, a lot of players don't even realize that when you bank with um, an institution, they often give you free uh, financial advice. You know? And I think there's a, there's a trust, trust issue oh, yes. with, with sitting down with a stranger who's in a suit and handing over your money, um, but that was that was the best thing that I did, just to so that we could get a clear idea or view of what we could and couldn't do. What the future might look like if you did this now rather yeah. than that. Yeah. Yeah. And the 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 psychological just the, the pressure uh, the release uh, 
the pressure was just lifted off your, off off our shoulders. It was just like you you now know mm -hmm. you more the things are more clear. Um, so I would that's something that I recommend for any uh, professional athlete, anyone in the, in the entertainment, because it's a very fickle industry. Mm -hmm. But um, most people retire, and they only have to find something to keep them busy for the last bit of, of their working lives, or their yeah. But a sportsman like yourself, you retire young, mm. and there's a whole another life ahead of you. So what are you what are you planning? What are you doing? I think as soon as as soon as you sign your first professional contract, you must be planning for what I call the afterlife. Mm -hmm. um, there's the old cliche of a coach coming off the field and saying it was, an, it was a game of two halves. You know, one half was positive, one half was negative. It didn't go our way in the second half. And you can, you can compare that to a footballer's uh, journey as well. You have all the glory and the physique and the fitness and the money and the girls and the cars. And then all of a sudden, that's cut off. Now you have to deal with journalists, not for only you. <laughs> you know, your bum getting soft because you don't have that um, you know, that fitness regime, you know, or the, the team element to get you training. Uh, your your partner is looking at you differently. You know, um, <coughs> the the stats are actually quite frightening <coughs> in Europe and uh, in Europe and in South Africa. Seventy five percent of ex footballers five years from when they retire will be either divorced, bankrupt, drug or alcohol dependent, or a mixture of all of those. So I don't think people should underestimate uh, that that point when they do have to retire. Mm -hmm. uh, in in football if you have if you if you retire in your early thirties to mid thirties you've done very well for yourself. So what are you keeping yourself busy with and focusing on? I, I didn't have an opportunity to uh, study after after school. Um, it's it's something that I really miss. I, I would have loved to have gone to a, a UCT or a Stellenbosch and experienced that kind of uh, res atmosphere. You know, the, um, but because of traveling at at that time, we were traveling around the world with under twenties and under twenty threes, uh, especially on the continent. So it just you know. In a hotel room in Togo with a teammate, you know, I, there was just no way I could study and be disciplined enough to, to do it. So I'm also a, a procrastinator. So after I retired, I, I finally decided to, to to study. I'm doing a, a political science degree through UNISA. Um, I'm also on a couple of panels: uh, the South African Institute for Drug Free Sport. Uh, as an ex, ex athlete, I'm on the panel. Um, also, the Premier Soccer League's disciplinary committee. Um, we need to get more uh, footballers on on those kinds of mm. uh, panels, especially the dispute resolution chamber. Uh, I'm the only I'm the only ex player to to represent on that particular rotational panel. Um, I'm also in the artificial grass industry. Uh, I'm writing a book, and I've got two young boys to look after as well. So. <laughs> What's the book about? Um, it's it's about the topic that we've just discussed with regards to players uh, falling on hard times. Um, I've interviewed uh, 17 personalities from around the world and locally. Um, and half of their chapter is about uh, their funny anecdotes. Um, and then the other half is about life lessons, hard, hard lessons that they learned. Mm -hmm. Serious stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you're also involved in clinics for schools? Yeah, my wife uh, and I started uh, the Booth Education and Sports Trust in 2009. It was kind of viewed as our give back. Um, the industry has, has given me the life that I live now. Uh, so as cliched as it might sound, you have to, you know, it's, it's obligatory um, to say thank you. So half of the, the trust is about football clinics. Um, so what I do is we get ex-professionals to, to come and uh, help out with with kids, whether it be at private schools, government schools, or um, local communities. Uh, and then the other half is book clubs. Um, both myself and my wife are avid re readers. Um, we've made sure both our boys are also. And it's, it, I think it's 
it's a pastime which is um, really lacking in our society. There with, I think it's five thousand books is a bestseller. Yeah, five thousand. And one percent of the of the population <laughs> buy books yeah. for personal consumption. And my wife no. jokes about uh, the safest place to keep money these days is inside a book. <laughs> <laughs> um, tell me about her, Sonia. How did you meet? How did you decide she was the one? Yeah, bless her. Um, she's been through quite a quite a lot. Um, we we met uh, in two thousand after the Olympics. And uh, so you were barely twenty. Yeah. 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 Um, fresh eyed up from from Cape Town, which is a big city. And uh, one of my teammates, um, who was from Cameroon, had a young daughter from Paris who was out visiting. And we were actually making a trip on on the continent, and he needed. Uh, babysitter so he asked a friend of his and my wife to look after the, the child and when we returned from our trip um, that's when, when I met her. And okay so we know she's beautiful but what <laughs> caught your heart uh, after that? Well at the time she was a model and she didn't strike me as a typical model you know uh, all full of herself so that that, that impressed me uh, and um, she wasn't a football fan which was a was, which was might sound a bit odd, but it was it was it was a positive. Um, Why? I didn't really want her knowing who I was or what I did. Um, it might sound a bit strange, but I think you know you as a professional sportsman with retirement in mind, it's quite important to try and meet your partner before you've made it, <laughs> if that mm. makes sense. A lot of the times I feel... So know, that she doesn't buy into the personality, yeah. the persona. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but rather for who yes. you are. <laughs> yeah. um, a lot of the times, the, I mentioned the divorce rate, mm -hmm. uh, and that, that is often because of, of financial issues once they've retired. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so that, that was what uh, struck me about her. Um, Besides the fact that she was uh, very attractive, um, <laughs> quite athletic looking, which is uh, which is always a good thing for me. <laughs> um, so yeah, there were a number of other reasons. Uh, what yeah, makes it work? It's by, what um, almost twenty years later. Mm. Uh, it's work in progress. Mm. Always uh, is constant. Huh? Yeah, mm. um, I think uh, dialogue. Uh, Communication is always a good thing. Never going to bed angry with one another. Uh, it's something that we haven't gotten right all the time, but that's something that we always talk about that we have to do. Um, I think having two young boys who keep us uh, distracted at times as well also helps, so that we don't kind of crowd Sweet each to other. Small stuff yeah. too much because you don't have time. That's right. Yeah. But certainly um, in the early days. Uh, it got on very well right from the word go. So it was just, you know, there's, there's a certain energy when you meet somebody. Um, and that, that happened. <laughs> um, it was a long distance relationship uh, often. And among other things, you lived in Russia for quite a while. Um, how did you keep it going? And also, what was the Russian experience like for you? Yeah, I'd, at different stages of my career, I'd, I'd, I'd attempted to go to your more established leagues, <coughs> excuse me, yeah, for example, England or Spain, and for various reasons, it hadn't worked out. So when I got the Russian uh, opportunity, I took it because I knew that time was running out. Um, 2002, I went to Rostov, and at that stage, my wife was just finishing her degree, which was another uh, reason why I wanted to get my degree. <laughs> I was tired of losing arguments. <laughs> um, so she was finishing off her degree and pregnant. Um, so you can imagine with me going to Russia for, I think, for the first three months by myself. At that period, with my wife being pregnant and finishing off her degree, you know, she wrote her last exam with a stomach like that, <laughs> you know, um, was, was probably our most testing time in our relationship. Long distance is, is uh, yeah, it's very tough. Um, and then as soon as she finished, she came over to, to stay with me. Um, so you can imagine a, a 
women from Soweto, uh, staying in Russia, in the south of Russia, um, where you stick, stick out like a sore thumb. In fact, even myself, I, I would walk, I would have this beard and wear a certain design of clothes, and people would instantly recognize me as being foreign. You know, um, it's at that stage, Russia was still quite. Um, insular. What's the word? Yeah, insular. Um, it has changed quite dramatically uh, of late, but at that stage, there was a very clear generation of very disgruntled, uh, depressed people, and then there was your MTV generation of younger, sort of more hip kids. Um, and we stayed in two provincial towns, so that kind of element was almost heightened or exaggerated. In fact, Samara, where we stayed for four years, was even during communist times was a closed city because that's where they manufactured all their uh, rockets and uh, military hardware. So four years in Samara was, an, was certainly an eye opener for the two of us. Yeah. And how did she? How did she do it? I mean, she must have been incredibly lonely. Um, she she made friends quite easily. Um, she attempted to use to learn the language, which was always it always endears yourself to yes. the, the, the the populace, you know. Especially when I, as a footballer, is earning money from indirectly from the fans, from the, from the mm -hmm. people. It's very important to make an effort um, to learn their cultures, to learn their superstitions. You um, speak Russian now. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, I was fluent when I left in two thousand and eight. Um, I'm hardly a linguist, uh, but I was pretty fluent. Uh, well, four last... years of total immersion must have must have yeah. done that. Yeah. yeah. The first two years, I had a translator, which was a mistake. And in the next four years, I made a concerted effort to learn the language. Mm. Um, and uh, I've lost a lot of it now mm. because we don't have such a big uh, Russian pop, uh, community here, apparently. Mm. And tell me about your boys. Can you remember the first time you held Nathan, the el eldest? Yeah, it's I, always um, such a moment for a parent, for any parent. You know, it's funny because on on television you you see that these kids on the adverts all chubby and you know, <laughs> thick set and well built and uh, dimpled and pretty. When I first first saw my kid, I thought he was sick, or you know, like and <laughs> newborns are not on? pretty because <laughs> uh, you're so thin and and fragile. Um, and I and I missed the birth because I was in Russia, uh, and he came he came early. He came two weeks early. Um, so when he arrived at the airport, I looked inside the, the, the car cut. chair and I just I couldn't believe how small he was. <laughs> so my wife assured me that he was fine. <laughs> um, and he, yeah, of course they they grow very quickly. Um, he's now thirteen years old. He's he's uh, you know he's almost as tall as me. <laughs> uh, so I can't I can't beat him anymore because <laughs> uh, soon he's I'm going to have to look up to him. Yeah. And how have they changed you, do you think? Uh, dramatically. Uh, <laughs> you become, you become, you know, getting married is a, is a change moment for sure. But having your first child, um, your, your interests and your, your selfishness has to be put aside. It's all about your kids. Um, and that is, uh, I've heard people say that a lot, and it certainly is true. The dynamic changes, without a doubt. Uh, myself, my wife used to go out and you know, have a party or go to dinner when you wanted. Or, you know, we were pretty carefree, but uh, that all comes mm -hmm. to an end uh, financially as well. And in addition to being a professional athlete, where your time is quite short. Uh, that also has a has an impact on what you can and cannot spend, you know, what holidays you can go on. Um, but I'll be it's just the whole the whole process has been magical. Uh, watching my my two boys uh, generate and keep character characteristics which my dad taught me um, is 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 great, great to see. What do you want to teach them? What's the most important thing you want them to take into life? I think um, there can be no vague areas of what is right and what is wrong when it comes to treating uh, people. Uh, and I think, you know, when they were quite young, I used to, I used to have to smack them. 
know, which is what my dad and mom did to me. But the first thing that you do when they do something well is is put your arm around them and give them a kiss and a hug. Um, my mom and my dad always insisted that when we wake up in the morning and when we go to bed at night, we always have a hug and a kiss. You know, and that's something that I've also done with them. So, and I've 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 found that they even at this age know exactly what is right and what is wrong. And if they do try and uh, step Blow over the, the line, boundaries, yeah. it just takes a, a look. <laughs> and there's that kind of fearful respect that crosses their eyes and they know. So, yeah, so far, I think I'm, we are getting it right. But as parents, you know, you can only just cross your fingers and, and hope, especially in this modern modern age that we're living in. Uh, you lived in other places, in Russia, in Spain, in England. Uh, did you ever consider moving permanently? Uh, no. No, we used those ventures as a, as a source to generate um, income and generate an education uh, and generate memories, uh, as anybody would do going on holiday. Um, but South Africa has always been our, our place of residence or, or our plan has always been to to stay here mm. <laughs> until our dying day. We've got no reason to, to move. Uh, my wife is from Soweto. I'm from, from Cape Town in the south. Um, we we love the country. We've we've still got a lot of traveling to do within the country. You know, there's so many provinces which are underestimated and people don't don't visit enough of. And that's what we plan on doing in the next uh, upcoming years. And which area have you chosen to live in? Well, we, we're quite happy up in Johannesburg for the time being. Um, my wife uh, wants to do what she wants to do, and, and it happens to be up, up in Johannesburg. Um, we do have plans on, on perhaps moving down to Cape Town once our boys are out of school. Um, but, you know, things, plans change all the time. Uh, but we're very happy. We're in a happy place. And, um, yeah, hopefully it stays away. Thank you so much, and long may that last. Yes, hope so. Thank, Thank you. you for being with us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, really. Until the next time, goodbye. <laughs>